Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is The Famine Irish in the USA, The Promised Land. After Ireland, no country was affected more by the effects of the Great Famine than the United States of America. The sheer numbers of people that emigrated to the USA during and after the Great Hunger defies belief. By 1890, there were nearly 2 million Irish-born people living in the USA. The population of Ireland at the time was only 5.7 million. This podcast is their story. As the title suggests, the USA was in many cases something of a promised land for many of these people. However, as we are about to see, experiences varied from place to place and person to person. We will begin by joining them on journeys across the Atlantic Ocean. Then we will visit four particular communities, hearing the fascinating stories of Irish emigrants in the USA in the late 19th century, which will give us an insight into their story. First, we will take a look around the notorious New York slum of the Five Points. From there, we will head to the coal fields of Pennsylvania to see the hardships emigrants endured, before heading out west to look at darker chapters from the Irish-American story in New Mexico and California. As always, I am indebted to the listeners of the podcast who have become patrons. Each month, listeners like you contribute whatever they can afford, and this allows me to continue the research and recording. In return for their support, patrons like you get exclusive extra material such as episode guides and podcasts. You can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's Patreon, P-A-T. R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Irish podcast. All patrons also get a shout out through the course of the series and this week I want to thank Dahi O'Shanachan, Susan Halloran, Tony Cullen, Owen O'Neill, Patrick Burns, Luke Hussey, Tom Mason, Deirdre Murphy, Ethna McKinnell, Richard Tapp and Aaron Gilmore. If you want to get a shout out, you can become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. In 1850, Veer Henry Lewis Foster joined over 870 others on board the Washington for a journey from Liverpool to New York. Now Foster was very different to most on board who were fleeing the famine in Ireland. Born into extreme privilege, he was the son of an English aristocrat and he was travelling on the Washington to gain an insight into the conditions for ordinary Irish famine emigrants. Now things had changed massively in the three years since 1847 when hundreds of thousands of Irish people had flocked to Canada. Firstly, Irish people were no longer heading to Canada in such large numbers. Instead, by 1850, they were heading to the USA and New York in particular. More importantly though, The death rate among emigrants, which had been a shocking 20% in 1847, had plummeted to around 2% in 1850. The changes that had affected this positive transformation in the emigrant experience were symbolised by the ship on which Foster travelled, the Washington. It had been specifically designed to carry emigrants, unlike the refitted cargo ships that had been used on the voyages to Canada in 1847. By the time the Washington berthed in New York, only 12 of its 875 passengers had died. While this might seem high, it wasn't bad by contemporary standards at all. However, while the baseline barometer of success of an emigrant voyage, that is the very survival of the passengers, had improved dramatically, the journey for the hundreds of thousands of Irish people heading to the USA was still deeply traumatic. Indeed, the experience shocked Veer Foster to the core. During the voyage across the Atlantic, he chronicled the conditions on board the ship. While the vessel itself may have been very impressive, the behaviour and the actions of the crew were in a word brutal. They treated the passengers like livestock, frequently beating them. For the six-week voyage, the passengers were subjected to a cruel dictatorship where the captain and crew took everything they could from them. It had begun before the ship had even left Liverpool. As part of the preparations for the voyage, it had fallen to the ship's doctor to draw up an inventory of all passengers in order to purchase adequate supplies of food. 
However, the doctor in many cases intentionally marked adults down as children, allowing them to cut back on food when buying supplies. This had dire consequences for the passengers because food supplies ran short. Frequently, the only way to get what should have been a normal portion was to bribe the crew. To make matters worse, those on board were completely at the mercy of the crew who frequently subjected them to random acts of sadistic violence. Veer Foster himself was badly beaten when he complained about the conditions on board. With little option but to accept the brutal regime for the six weeks, the Washington finally arrived in New York in December 1850. If the journey itself remained a gauntlet though, the passengers on board the Washington soon discovered that this was only the beginning. Starting a new life in the USA was not always easy and as we are about to see, New York was not the most welcoming of places in the 1850s. While the conditions emigrants faced on board the Washington shocked the English aristocrat Veer Henry Foster, what he found in New York equally outraged him. In 1851, he would warn newly arriving emigrants about the city. His words are read here by Darren Bennett. On arrival in New York, all emigrants should immediately apply for advice to the British consul, Mr. Barclay. Emigrants should trust no one else, as New York is a thorough nest of robbers. Indeed, Foster recommended emigrants should leave New York as soon as possible. While he considered it to be dangerous, he also commented on how work in New York was not as easy to come by as many thought. Each week, thousands of new emigrants arrived in, all of them desperate to find work. Ruthless employers were exploiting this situation to drive down wages. One emigrant, the Cork woman, Margaret McCarthy, wrote home to Ireland talking about her life in New York a few months after her arrival. Lisa O'Sullivan now reads her words. New York, September 22nd, 1850. I write, hoping that these few lines may find you all in as good state of health as I am in at present, thank God. My dear father, I must only say that this is a good place and a good country, for if no one place does not suit a man, he can go to another and can very easily please himself. But there is one thing that's ruining this place, especially the frontier towns and cities where the flow of immigration is most. The immigrants has not money enough to take them to the interior of the country, which obliges them to remain here in New York, for which reason causes the less demand for labour and also the great reduction in wages. For this reason, I would advise no one to come to America that would not have some money after landing here, that would enable them to go west in case they would get no work to do here. No more at present from your ever dear and loving child, Margaret McCarthy. However, in spite of the competition for work and the difficult conditions, New York still became one of the main centres of Irish famine emigrants. Around one in five of the Irish who arrived in the port remained here and by 1855 nearly one in three in the city were Irish born. Next, I want to take a look at some of their experiences. New York in the 1850s was scarcely a fraction of the size it is today. Concentrated around Lower Manhattan, the population stood at around 500,000 in 1850. This was growing fast, being added to every year by thousands of Irish people arriving off boats. Far from home, the Irish developed intensely close-knit communities congregated in a few districts of the city where they quickly became the dominant ethnic group. For example, by 1855, over 35% of the population of the 6th District of New York had been born in Ireland, a figure that does not even begin to factor in the children of these people who had been born in the USA. At the heart of the 6th District was the infamous Five Points, a notorious slum portrayed in the 2002 film Gangs of New York. This densely populated area was notorious at the time and the conditions in which its inhabitants, many of whom were Irish, lived, frequently attracted commentary. In 1844, an American woman, Lydia Maria Child, described the conditions she encountered on a visit to the area. Her words are read by Laura Pasek. Morally and physically, the breathing air was like an open tomb. How souls or bodies could live there, I could not imagine. There you will see nearly every form of human misery, 
every sign of human degradation. The leer of the licentious, the dull sensualism of the drunkard, the sly glance of the thief, oh, it made my heart ache for days. Such a depiction of life in the five points is backed up by numerous other contemporary sources. Just after the famine in 1853, the newly founded New York Daily News ran regular articles entitled A Walk Among the City Poor. In February 1853, they visited Orange Street. Known as Baxter Street today, it was one of the five streets that converged in the infamous Five Points. The account from the New York Daily News is now read by Martin Nutty. In a narrow part of Orange Street, a short distance from the Five Points, you find the homes of these people. The first house which we entered was a high, quite spacious building which must have been a handsome house once. The halls were wide and airy, the rooms high, and the windows larger than any on that block. Yet everything was in the last degree of filth. The walls were sooty and mired, the stairs matted hard with mud, and the halls with little hillocks scattered along of dirt, which has been collecting and hardening perhaps these fifty years. We groped our way among offal and refuse, the light coming in dimly through the big round windows. Through the course of his visit, the newspaper reporter met with Irish and Italian families who shared this building. After visiting a few Italian families, he moved to the home of two Irish women. In the room behind this, a great deal more filthy and wretched, were two Irish women, sewing rags. We sat down and had a long chat about their lodgings and their neighbours and their business. They bought the rags for one and a half cents a pound, then cut them in strips, sewed them together and sold them at four cents a pound for rag carpets. Could earn four shillings a week. The room cost them four dollars a month. The reporter asked about their Italian neighbours who had almost no English and the reply was very instructive about how the recently arrived Irish saw themselves in New York. They were very much at home. As we will see, it was others who they saw as foreigners, even though they had literally come off the boats in many cases. Very days in them foreigners, said they. They never make no noise at all or disturbance. They certainly never drink, and they are as quiet as lambs on the Sundays. We hear them saying over and over, something late o' night sometimes, and we think it's uh, their way of praying. Poor craters, but we don't know what their religion is. After this, the article continued to detail other fascinating information about living conditions in the five points of the time. In the rear of the court behind the house, we found some small houses, packed full again of people, and with a nauseating stench about them. The cellars, rooms about ten feet by twelve, were crowded, though the walls would have been dripping with damp except for a hot fire of coals. The people in these were all Irish, singularly healthful looking for livers in such a pen, and cheerful, ready to give and take a joke, as their countrymen always are. Only one, a woman spoke bitterly, and she said, It was a blessed thing for the poor when they had no children. This is very much the stereotypical view of how we imagine that first wave of Irish famine emigrants living in truly appalling conditions. However, the story of the five points and slums like it is more complex than one of pure misery, such as that portrayed in the above account, or indeed the film Gangs of New York. There is no doubt that the accounts of deprivation are true. There are simply too many of them to discount. Equally, there's no doubting that these conditions must have had an impact on health and life expectancy. However, the accounts describing the living conditions were, by and large, written for and by people who never spent a single night in the houses and buildings that horrified them and certainly knew very little about the individual lives of the people who lived there. More recent evidence has revealed that the lives of this early generation of famine emigrants was far more complex than just a story of degradation in the five points. First and foremost, while work may have been in short supply in 1850, even the poor Irish living in New York were not penniless. While the influx of emigrants was used by employers to slash wages, the massive building boom to accommodate New York's soaring population provided many with work. Lots of these people were earning decent enough wages, certainly good enough to send large amounts of money back to Ireland. For example, in 1847 alone, one million dollars was sent from the US cities of Philadelphia, Baltimore and New York. 
This is not the actions of a few Irish people on the road to extreme wealth. A contemporary at the time noted how it was primarily made up of poor Irish sending small amounts that made up the overall total. The idea that many Irish were able to accumulate small amounts of money is supported by recent research from the American historian Tyler Ambinder who trolled through the records of, of the New York Emigrant Savings Bank revealing some pretty startling and fascinating details about the lives of famine emigrants living in the Five Points. One story is that of Ellen Holland. Born in Kerry in 1813, Ellen was married and had three sons before the onset of the Great Famine. In the later years of the Great Hunger, her landlord, Lord Lansdowne, devised an assisted emigration scheme which saw thousands of his tenants, including Ellen and her family, leave Ireland for America. She arrived in the Five Points with her husband Richard and their sons. Now there's no question life in the Points was hard as we have heard from the accounts of the houses. However, both Ellen and her husband were able to find work, he as a labourer and she as a washerwoman. In two and a half years, they had enough money to open a bank account and lodged $110. However, in 1855, Ellen suffered a major blow when she lost her husband, Richard, and a son who died that year. However, Ellen, despite this major setback on a personal level and indeed on a financial level due to the loss of her husband's earning power, persevered and by 1860 her savings were around $200. Converting this to modern currency is tricky but it was probably the equivalent of tens of thousands of dollars today. This was not the mythical streets paved in gold experience but for Ellen Holland who nearly starved to death less than 15 years previously it was by no means insignificant. One question that does immediately arise from her story is why on earth did she not spend a sum of her money to move out of the five points? There are reasons, however, why people like Ellen would want to remain there, despite the overcrowding and the poor housing. Firstly, the tight-knit community formed by the Irish in these neighbourhoods provided one of the last connections people like Ellen had to a home in Ireland that they would never see again. Secondly, the fact that there was very few safety nets available gave people like Ellen an incentive to save rather than spend. For example, the story of Susan Mitchell, another woman whose life followed a similar trajectory to Ellen, shows how important savings could be in hard times in the 1850s and 60s. Susan had also arrived in the Five Points in 1851 with four children and on arrival she had worked with her husband as a tailor. Like Ellen Holland, Susan Mitchell lost her husband a few years after she arrived, but she too persevered and by 1857 had saved $500, which was lodged in the Emigrant Savings Bank. However, in 1857, Susan was hit by the effects of an economic downturn, but she was able to survive for a year on her substantial savings until things improved. While Ellen Holland and Susan Mitchell's lives are of people who find some modicum of stability, there are also stories of people succeeding in society. The image of the pauper to millionaire story is highly exceptional and not really representative, but there are more who enjoyed what might be considered modest successes. Patrick Lennon is one such individual. Lennon was an emigrant who had arrived in 1848 and worked as a porter until 1860 saving money. He then withdrew a total of $800 and was able to open a grocer's shop. While these are just a few stories, the accounts of the emigrant bank show they were by no means unusual. The historian Tyler Ambinder in a study looked at 900 random accounts from the total of 18,000 that survived from the 1850s and these revealed that the Irish community, no matter where they fit on the social ladder, were saving some money at least. This doesn't mean they were on their way to becoming the next J.P. Morgan or John D. Rockefeller. Such people, despite the mythology, were very rare in American history. Nevertheless, many Irish people living in appalling conditions were able to achieve modest stability. The image of grinding poverty in the five points, while part of the story, doesn't give us the full picture. This story of New York and the communities there is only one tiny fraction of the overall Irish experience though. Indeed, four in every five Irish people who landed in the city left New York. While it's impossible to chart every Irish experience, now we must leave the five points and head west. Not too far, but well beyond the confines of New York. But first I think we deserve a breather. <laughs> 
Schuylkill County in eastern Pennsylvania is just within the commuter belt of New York City. However, the 125 miles people travel each day to work in the city would be jaw-dropping to our ancestors in the 1840s. In the 19th century, Schuylkill was days away from and worlds apart from the overcrowded, congested conditions of the Five Points in lower Manhattan. Nestled in the eastern foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, this was largely open countryside where older people in the 1840s could remember the days when it had been a frontier. In the 1750s, the British and French had fought a brutal war in this part of the world, known as the French-Indian War or the Seven Years' War. Not long after the British had emerged victorious, the mistreatment of Native Americans resulted in one of the great rebellions in North American history, Pontiac's War. The defeat of this revolt in 1763 was followed by the American Revolutionary War not long afterwards. By the 1840s, life in eastern Pennsylvania was more placid. The Native Americans had been dispossessed of their lands and rights and European settlements were springing up, unfettered across Scuggle. At first glance, this is not where we can expect to find Irish famine emigrants. The maps of Scogel County portray a history with little trace of Irish involvement. Places such as Oneida and the nearby Susquehanna River are reminders of the Native Americans. Then the name Scogel itself is Dutch, while the town of Nuremberg is a legacy of the German colonists who were among the first Europeans to settle the region in large numbers. However, Irish people did come to Scogel County in large numbers. Their story is preserved in a much bleaker name though, not of a town, but instead of a specific event. That is, Black Thursday, or as it is known in some quarters, the Day of the Rope. This refers to a mass execution of 10 Irish men in an event which haunts the Irish-American story in eastern Pennsylvania and far beyond, telling us so much about the contradictions and complexities of Irish-American history. The Day of the Rope, in many ways, was the ending of the initial chapter of the Irish experience in Pennsylvania, and it can be best understood if told in reverse. So we will start on the Day of the Rope itself, June 21st, 1877, and unfold this fascinating story from there. The primary events of the Day of the Rope took place in the county town of Scoogle, a place called Pottsville and are best seen and understood through the eyes of contemporaries. The New York Times front page report recreates the picture of that day and is read now by Ryan McCormack. The morning broke on a heavy sky with ominous clouds and an atmosphere of oppressive closeness. Large numbers of persons began pouring into the town at an early hour and the approaches to the jail building, the terrace of the adjoining courthouse and the neighboring hilltops were soon covered with a heterogeneous but quiet and orderly assemblage of men women and children. These people were arriving to bear witness to the execution of six Irish men while 50 miles away in Machunk, a town known today as Jim Thorpe, another four Irish men were due to meet a similar fate. These were the beginnings of what eventually transpired to be 20 executions of Irish Catholics. On the day in question though, the town of Pottsville was gripped by immense tension. Alcohol sales were banned in fear of a booze-filled backlash, while security at the prison itself was extraordinary in fear of a rescue attempt. The New York Daily News again observed, The jail door was guarded by a strong detachment of borough police. The jurymen, the visiting sheriffs from other counties of whom there were a number, other officials and the physicians were admitted first about 8 o'clock. An hour afterwards, the reporters were let in, and after another interval, all other persons holding cards of admission. The utmost care was taken in scrutinizing the cards and those offering them. Each was compared with an entry in a book held by a deputy, and each entry was checked off as the holder passed in. All the reporters were required to repeat a thrice-made promise not to mention the names of those officiating at the executions. The authorities stand in great fear of reprisals. The reprisals were supposedly going to come from the Irish Catholic community in the area and in particular a secret society called the Molly Maguires that supposedly controlled most of this community. The condemned men were also supposedly members of this secret society and had carried out murders in its name. However, the Molly Maguires almost certainly did not exist or at least did not exist in the way it was claimed and many of those on the gallows were innocent. Their executions instead were as a result of the intersection of class, race and sectarian tensions which had begun back in the 1840s and before. 
The origins of the Day of the Rope are wide and varied and can be traced to multiple places on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, but are rooted in Irish experiences of hardships at home and in America. In many ways, the stage was set in the early 19th century with the discovery of anthracite in the hills of Skogel and eastern Pennsylvania, an event which changed this rural landscape forever. By the early 1840s, mines were dotted across this once pristine terrain to meet what was an insatiable desire for anthracite. This anthracite coal fired furnaces, powered trains and heated the homes of the rapidly growing cities along the eastern seaboard of the US. These labour-intensive mining operations soon began to attract large numbers of emigrants looking for work. While it is something of a generalisation, there are a few distinct waves of miners into the coal fields. In the 1840s and before, large numbers of Welsh and English miners arrived in Scoogle and the surrounding region. These were often highly skilled miners coming from the coal districts in Wales, Northern England and Cornwall. From the late 1840s onwards, they were followed by large numbers of Irish emigrants escaping the famine. The Irish who arrived though can be divided into several groups but for the sake of clarity I'm going to focus in on two distinct waves. The first group actually came from my hometown. This is Castlecomer in North Kilkenny and as many of you will know from a podcast series I have made in the town it has a somewhat unusual history given it's built around coal mines. Therefore many of the Castlecomer emigrants arriving in Scogel and eastern Pennsylvania had heavily sought after skills because of their experience of mining anthracite back in Castlecomer. They were followed by a second very different group of Irish people. These largely hailed from the west of Ireland and had no mining experience which left them at a distinct disadvantage in the coal fields. They had to take the worst jobs as labourers which was often precarious poorly paid work. While the mines in Scoogle allowed them to escape the hardships of the New York City slums that Veer Foster and others warned about, life in eastern Pennsylvania brought with it a very different kind of hardship for these famine emigrants. Ruthless mine bosses were constantly trying to keep wages as low as possible for what was extraordinarily heavy work in dangerous conditions. Accidents were all too common. Fatalities were frequent. In 1869, 110 miners were killed in the Avondale disaster in Pennsylvania when a mine had caught fire. Up until the 1870s, children were working below ground in the mines and while a ban was instituted to stop under 12s going underground in 1870, they could still work above ground sorting coal long after this. With mine owners treating their workers atrociously, two key methods of resistance and workplace organising emerged, loosely shaped by where the given miners had come from in Europe. In the coal districts of England and Wales, early trade unions were beginning to emerge and in the 1840s the first trade unions were formed in the Pennsylvanian coal fields by workers from these regions. Many Irish would join these trade unions which met with varied successes. Their key tactics was organising strikes in the coal fields which were often met with brutal repression. In 1858, serious riots broke out during a strike for better wages around the town of Asheville. Eventually, the army was called in to suppress the strikes. On this occasion, the miners backed down in the face of overwhelming odds. Four years later, in the midst of the US Civil War, soldiers were again called out from Philadelphia to suppress another strike. On this occasion, it was the mine owners who would back down. While many Irish workers joined these trade unions, some also formed their own organisations based on their experiences back in Ireland. Rather than trade unions, secret societies had been a common form of organisation in Ireland. Clandestine in nature, their membership was smaller and they adopted far more radical tactics. In a way to resist the mine bosses, they frequently issued death threats to mine managers, threats that were carried out on numerous occasions. However, in what was indicative of the complexity of the Irish story in Scogel County, Irish miners formed numerous, different and often rival secret societies shaped by regional and sectarian divisions. For example, the Castlecomer miners organised themselves into what was known as the Sheet Iron Gang. Meanwhile, the poorer labourers from the west of Ireland formed themselves into what was loosely and collectively called the Molly Maguires, who we will return to. Interestingly though, the Sheet Iron Gang and the Molly Maguires were bitter rivals frequently fighting each other in the coal fields. Now while violence was part of life in the Pennsylvanian collieries, some of it undoubtedly being perpetrated by Irish secret societies, it was one Irish American in particular 
that brought about the events that escalated into the Day of the Rope. His name was Franklin B. Gown. Historical events rarely, if ever, have a single creator or primary actor, but instead are the result of actions of hundreds, if not thousands of people. However, of the multitudes involved in the events that led to the Day of the Rope in Pennsylvania, one Irish American is responsible above all others. This was Franklin B. Gowan, a man very different from most of his contemporaries. Born in Philadelphia in the 1830s, he was the son of an Irish immigrant who had arrived in the USA in 1811. Like many pre-famine emigrants, Franklin Gowan's father James was Protestant. During his upbringing, Franklin grew up in a Philadelphia where tensions in the Irish community between Catholics and Protestants were rising. Serious rioting had broken out in the summer of 1844, with several people being killed and property damaged to the tune of millions of dollars. We can only assume this influenced the views of Franklin Gowan, given what was to follow. At the age of 26, Franklin qualified as a lawyer in 1862, and he too followed the thousands heading to Schuylkill County. While he would soon join fellow Irish Americans in the coal business, Franklin had no interest in labouring down mines. He set his sights far higher. In 1862, he started working as the district attorney in Schuylkill County. Part of this work involved taking cases against Irishmen purportedly involved in the secret society murders taking place in the coal fields. However, convictions proved almost impossible given the clandestine nature of these groups. This, however, was only the beginning of Franklin's involvement in the story of Pennsylvania's coal fields. By 1864, he had been appointed president of the Reading Railroad Company, which also had extensive mining interests in the region. This inevitably led Gowan into conflict with miners' organisations, particularly trade unions, who he saw as an obstacle to his long-term plans of extending the Reading Company's control over the coal business in eastern Pennsylvania. Now Gowan proved himself utterly ruthless in the lengths he was willing to go to crush the emerging trade unions. As president of the Reading Company, he paid the Pinkerton Detective Agency $100,000 to investigate the miners in and around Schuylkill County. The Pinkertons identified the Irish Catholic community as their key target as a means to bring down the labour movement. They hired James McParland, himself an Irish Catholic from South Armagh, to gather intelligence. And using the alias James Kenna, McParland spent years amongst the Irish community in and around Schuylkill County, developing what would become an elaborate conspiracy. The information gathered by McParland was fed back to the Pinkerton Agency and Franklin Gowan, leading eventually to a series of trials in 1877 which led directly to the Day of the Rope. What transpired in these trials was a terrible miscarriage of justice. While some of the accused had committed crimes, Franklin B. Gowan, who acted as prosecutor in the trials, concocted a conspiracy theory around the secret society called the Molly Maguires, which was one of the groups formed by poor Irish labourers in the Pennsylvania coal fields. However, the Molly Maguires under Gowan's interpretation were a highly centralised pseudo-paramilitary organisation orchestrating a reign of terror in the coal fields. Gowan would even claim that the Molly Maguires controlled the Ancient Order of Hibernians, a prominent Irish Catholic organisation, and the wider trade union movement in Pennsylvania. These claims were completely untrue to tarnish the emerging labour movement. While some members of the secret societies were also trade union members and members of the ancient order of Hibernians, no evidence was ever produced proving an actual connection between these groups. Nevertheless, Gowan secured 20 convictions using the testimony of James McParland, the Pinkerton agent, and by turning people facing the noose against their fellow accused. On June 21st, 1877, the first of these executions took place on a day known forevermore as the Day of the Rope. Through these trials and then the executions, Franklin Gowan had little interest in bringing justice or law to the coal fields. Indeed, intelligence gathered by the Pinkerton detective James McParland had been used to carry out assassinations of mining leaders prior to the trials. The entire process was clearly designed to break the labour movement in Pennsylvania. However, the fact that Gowan had used Irish Catholics as the battering ram to do this is not by any means coincidental. There is no doubt that the coal fields were pretty lawless from the 1840s onwards and many murders had been carried out by Catholic secret societies such as the Molly Maguires, but they were not what Gowan claimed them to be. 
While some of the accused were guilty, many of those executed were not. Ultimately, Gowan's smearing of the Irish Catholic community to damage the wider labour movement in the coal fields was fueled by his sectarianism and his racist understanding of the world. This may well have been shaped by Gowan's experiences of growing up in the highly sectarian climate of Philadelphia in the 1840s, a situation that had only worsened in the 1850s. As late as 1871, there had been serious rioting between Irish Catholic and Protestants in nearby New York. These undoubtedly shaped Gowan and many other people's biases towards Irish Catholics, leading them to believe that the Molly Maguires were indeed the pseudo-paramilitary organisation that had been claimed. While the experience of Irish Catholics in the coal fields of Pennsylvania was appalling, the Irish story in the USA is multifaceted. While the Irish were frequently poor and the victims of racism, we will also see now that they were the perpetrators of racism. To understand this though, we need to move further west. While the coal fields of Pennsylvania may not be where we expect to find evidence of the Irish American story, New Mexico is even more so the case. Situated 2,000 miles southwest of New York, there were a few places in the United States that could remind Irish emigrants how far they were from home than New Mexico. For those of you who are unaware, New Mexico is basically where westerns are often set. The landscape is dry and arid and as far from the Irish landscape as you can possibly imagine. Yet it was here where two Irish Americans in particular played a central role in one of New Mexico's most notorious events in the 19th century. Lawrence Murphy, an Irish Catholic, had been born in Wexford and emigrated to the USA during the famine. After a circuitous route took him through the Union Army in the Civil War, he ended up in Lincoln County, New Mexico. There he would join forces with another Irish Catholic, James Dolan, who, having been born in the midst of the Great Famine in Galway, had emigrated in the 1850s. Murphy and Dolan formed a partnership, becoming a dominant player in commerce and banking in Lincoln County, New Mexico. However, in the mid-1870s, they faced competition from a recent English emigrant, John Tunstall. Adopting a similarly ruthless approach to that of Gowan, they began attacking Tunstall's cattle stocks and eventually killed Tunstall himself. This triggered a conflict known as the Lincoln County War, which resulted in dozens of deaths. Incidentally, it would also launch the career of the most famous gunslinger of all time, William H. Bonney, also known as Billy the Kid. The experiences of Murphy and Dolan show that religion cannot be equated exclusively with class and poverty, as is often applied in narratives about Irish famine emigrants, where Catholics are universally poor and Protestants universally wealthy. Finally, as we move towards the end of this podcast, we cannot tell the story of Irish famine emigrants in America without talking about racism. While this will be teased out more in the upcoming episode on Irish involvement in the American Civil War, there could be no doubt that many Irish held deeply racist views of the world, shaped by how they saw themselves and others. The following account is taken from the website irishamericancivilwar.com run by Damien Shields, an expert in the topic who I'll be interviewing for the next episode. These events took place in California during the gold rush of 1849. Now after deposits of gold were discovered in the Rocky Mountains in the late 1840s, thousands of prospectors flocked west. Known to history as the 49ers, they all hoped to make a fortune. Most, however, ended up penniless. However, they included people from all over Europe and also large numbers of Asians, including people from Hawaii, known as Kanakas, who are mentioned in this account. William Downey, a Scottish prospector, witnessed the following events at a place called Bullard's Bar, 100 miles northeast of San Francisco. Downey's account is now read by Ronan McGreechan. For the first time, I saw a party organised for the purpose of driving away foreigners. What was implied by the term foreigners was not exactly clear to me at that time, and it would be hard for me to explain it even now. The little company, so organised, consisted of from 20 to 30 men. They were armed with pistols, knives, rifles and old shotguns and I remember distinctly that they were headed by a man who carried the stars and stripes. I took the opportunity to ask one of the men where they were going and for what purpose. In reply I was told in tip-top Tipperary Brogue that the expedition had set out for the purpose of exploring the river 30 miles up and down with a view to driving away all foreigners. The crowd was a motley one and as to nationality somewhat mixed. The Irish men were marching to drive off the Kanakas, that is, Hawaiians. They were joined by Dutchmen and Germans who could not speak a word of English. 
Then there were a few New Yorkers, but all joined hands in the alleged common interest of protecting the native soil against the invasion of foreigners. This eyewitness account is indicative of how some Irish saw themselves as racially superior to non-Europeans at the very least. Despite being immigrants who were viewed by many as being racially inferior, the Irish still considered Asians as somehow being foreign in America and that they, the Irish, were natives there. This sentiment is not unique to California. At the start of the episode, we saw a similar view reflected in the account of the Irish women from the Five Points who described their Italian neighbours as foreigners, thereby implying that they themselves were native. These stories recounted in today's podcast will hopefully show you that Irish America has a complex, contradictory and varied history. What has been hard to convey in this podcast is the millions of unrecorded stories, often the people who lived what might be called unexceptional lives but were probably influenced by one or more of the things I've talked about today. So to include their stories, I want to leave you with a song, which, over the course of a few verses, summarises many of the experiences I have not had time to cover. It was written by Philip Chevron, famous as a key member of the Pogues, and is unquestionably one of the most famous Irish emigration songs of the modern era. Titled Thousands Are Sailing, it was written in the late 1980s during another period of massive emigration to the USA. It takes the form of a conversation between two Irish emigrants, one from the 1980s and the other a ghost of a famine emigrant. We take it up here where the emigrant from the 1980s is asking the famine emigrant about his experiences. This rendition is performed by Monica Brennan and taken from her album Timeless, which is available online. Until next time... Sloan. Did you work upon the railroad? Did you rid the streets of crime? Were your dollars from the White House? Were they from the five and dime? Did the old songs taunt to cheer you? And did they still make you cry? Did you count the months and years? Or did your teardrops quickly? I know, says he, it was not to be on a coffin ship I came here and I never even got so far that they could change my name Thousands are sailing across the western ocean To a land of opportunity that some of them Manhattan's desert twilight In the death of afternoon We stepped hand in hand on Broadway Like the first man on the moon And the blackbird broke the silence As you whistled it so sweet And in Brendan Behan's footsteps I danced up and down the street Then we said goodnight to Broadway Giving it our best regards Tipped our hats to Mr. Cohen Dear old Times Square's favourite band Then we raised a glass to JFK And a dozen more besides When I got back to my empty room I suppose I must have cried Sky blue skies and oceans From rooms the daylight never sees Where lights don't glow